Hello, fellow lovers of custom cars and trucks and fabrication and stuff. It's Aaron with Man Candy Creations, and we've got an exciting episode for you today. Today, we are cutting off the front of my wife's truck. Man, I don't know what it is. This is the stuff that fuels me. This is the stuff that really gets me going. Maybe it's that little shot of adrenaline you get when you're making a big cut, knowing that you're essentially ruining a perfectly good car right now. And it's up to you to put it back together. And if you can't, if you can't, it's all over for good. Yeah, that's it. Welcome to Garage Fab. The main goal is to get the wheels to pull inside the fender more. Currently the tires rub on the fenders and I can't even lay the thing out. So the wheels need to pull in about an inch and a half, maybe two inches. There are much easier ways around this, like uh, getting different wheels with a different offset, but I really want to use these wheels. To me there's something really special about using something that nobody else will. By that I mean nobody else will be willing to do the work to make these wheels fit. My original plan was to shorten the control arms by an inch and a half. The problem there, I don't have an inch and a half between the air spring and the ball joint, nor do I have enough room behind the bag. Shortening the control arm two inches, even an inch and a half, will be a clearance nightmare. Problem number two, the lengths of the tie rods are determined by the lengths of the control arms. You cannot change the length of a control arm without also changing the length of the tie rod without it affecting steering and bump steer. Unfortunately, on the Mighty Max, I cannot shorten the tie rod for two reasons. One, the tie rod is cast steel and I refuse to weld cast steel. Two, this little fancy bend in the tie rod makes shortening it as much as I need to shorten it impossible. It's looking like shortening the control arms is not going to be as easy as I thought. Not to mention the control arms on these trucks are borderline too short as it is for air suspension. On a static truck, there's not that much travel that's expected. Air suspension, on the other hand, a lot more travel is expected, generally six to eight inches or more. The more travel that's needed, the more a control arm needs to articulate. The more a control arm articulates, the stranger things get for alignment at the extreme points of travel. And the shorter a control arm gets, the quicker things get weird. So it's looking like shortening the control arms is not an option at all. All right, so I need the wheels to pull in away from the fenders and I can't change the wheels and I can't shorten the control arms. So what else am I gonna do? Well, I've got an idea, but I need some more room to think. I need some elbow room. I, I need more room to work. I, I need some more room to explain. So I'll be back in a minute to explain my idea the best I can. Since shortening the control arms is no longer an option, I have to move the entire suspension assembly in towards the center of the truck two inches on both sides. And since the assemblies are welded to the frame, I get to cut the frame. Did I say get to? I mean, I have to. I, I have to cut the frame. I... Here's the plan, guys. I'm gonna cut the frame at the firewall here and here. And I have to cut the frame in front of the suspension, here and here. Lastly, the engine crossmember is welded between the frame rails, joining the two suspension assemblies into one unit. So I'm going to separate them by removing a four inch section from the center of the crossmember. That way, when I move each rail in two inches, the cut edges of the crossmember will meet and I'll be able to weld it back together. And this is where things get really exciting, guys. If you're not excited already, here it comes. Here it comes, man. While the suspension is already disconnected from the rest of the frame, I'm gonna take this opportunity to Z the frame. A Z relocates the suspension 
vertically on the chassis, basically lowering the vehicle without changing the suspension geometry. A front suspension Z is pretty much a good idea on any vehicle if you plan on lowering it or even more so air suspension. The reason is the suspension on production vehicles is already optimized at their stock ride height. Not so much for racing, but for safety, drivability, and tire wear. When we drop a vehicle using lowering springs or airbags, the factory geometry is getting pushed into positions that it was never designed to be in. Then we start seeing side effects like extreme camber, excessive toe, and bump steer. If you've spent any time at all around vehicles with adjustable suspension, you've probably seen vehicles where the front tires tow in and out as they go up and down. This can be drastically minimized just by doing a frame Z. For simplicity, imagine a static height vehicle and then lower the body around the suspension without even touching the springs. Now, before you decide to just go Z your frame, which I highly recommend, I think I should mention that there's going to be a lot more involved than what you're gonna see here today. One, the steering components are gonna go along for the ride when you relocate your suspension, which means your steering shaft or your column mount, or maybe even your dash may need to be modified to account for the movement in your steering column. Another thing that's going along for the ride is your motor. You'll not only be pushing the suspension up, but the motor as well, and you may be pushing the engine directly into the hood. So you may need to either modify your hood or drop the motor back down. In that event, you're likely going to need to build a custom cross member. And finally, the cut at the firewall is going to see a lot of stress. So have somebody do it that understands welding and stress fractures. Having the front end of your truck fall off while on the freeway would be dramatic. All right, guys, I'm about to cut into the frame, but there's a couple things I need to address before we do. One, I don't know if you noticed, when the frame moved in the animation, the motor mounts moved as well, and the motor is going to stay the same width as it always has, so I don't want to move the motor mounts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to weld them together with a bar in between and then remove them as one unit. So when I'm finished with the frame, I can weld everything back together and refit the motor mounts, and they will be the exact width and angle that they always were. Also, this is a steering box that I was telling you is going to go up and in with the frame modification, but right now it's in the way of the cuts and the welds that I need to make, so I'm going to disassemble the entire steering system. But while I'm at it, because I'm terrible at keeping on track, I want to show you something really cool with the Mighty Max steering, something that I may have to do in the future, though honestly, I really hope I don't. When I modify the frame, the steering box is going to go upwards and inwards towards the motor. And the problem with that is, you see how this is kind of sticking out there on the left side? The driver's side of the 4G63 is already very cluttered and this may contact parts of the motor once I move it in and up. That's something I'm really worried about, but I've already got a plan in case that happens. Here's the bare frame where the steering box was connected. This is the driver's side. This is the passenger side. See the three holes in the frame and the tab on top? Three holes in the frame and the tab on top. You guys see where I'm going with this? Check it out, guys. In less than five minutes, I was able to convert the mechanical portion of the steering on the Mighty Max from left-hand drive to right-hand drive because of their brilliant design. Again, the reason I'm considering this is this protrusion on the steering box is now on the outside away from the motor. That's really it. Now, if you're interested in doing the right-hand drive, there's a couple obvious modifications that you're gonna have to do and some not so obvious modifications. One, notice there's no hole in the firewall for where the steering shaft used to be. Nice big one there. You're gonna have to relocate that or make your own. And also your left-hand drive dash is gonna need to be swapped out with a right-hand drive one because your gauges are gonna be on the wrong side, as well as a support under the dash that holds your steering column in place. And, and your pedal assembly and the brake booster are also going to need to be swapped over to the other side. Other than that, it's pretty straightforward. Honestly, I am trying my hardest to not do right-hand drive on this truck. I don't know if you've ever had the chance to drive a right-hand car, but man, it is, it is weird. 
and we're not accustomed to it. I'm not accustomed to it. And this truck is going to be manual. Who wants to shift with their left hand? Not to mention this motor is going to be a little bit more powerful than this. I want to be comfortable while driving it. I want my wife to be comfortable while driving this truck. So again, I'm trying to not do right hand drive. If it comes to that though, and the motor doesn't fit, I'm going to show you guys exactly how it's done. All right, we are finally to the entire point of this video, which was cutting stuff apart. Sorry I talked too much. I didn't realize I was much of a talker until I started this YouTube thing, but wow. I just don't shut up, do I? <laughs> All right, but just a little bit more blabbing, guys. In 2008, when I was building D350, nine times out of 10, I was in the shop by myself, 11 and 12 at night. So I had a lot of people that were willing to help me. That late at night, I was pretty much on my own. So I had to figure out how to do this thing on my own. And when you cut the front end of the truck off, it, it doesn't seem like a lot, but man, it is heavy stuff and heavy things are awkward. So trying to figure out how to maneuver this thing around once you cut it off, I had to figure out a better way. And so this method that I'm gonna share with you today is what I came up with in 2008. Now, generally to do a frame modification like this, a frame table would be incredibly helpful right now, but I'm in a two car garage. I don't have a frame table and the chances are you don't either, which is what makes this method fantastic. Here's a basic setup. The truck is on jack stands on the frame. The jack stands are set at an equal height and the front jack stands are behind the point that we are going to be cutting to do the Z. So the truck for all intents and purposes is level and it doesn't have to be perfect guys. You don't have to bust out the bubble level and make sure that it's absolutely straight. This is what makes this process so special. As long as the ground you're working on is somewhat level, you're probably going to be fine. So since the jack stands are behind the point that we're going to be cutting, the entire front clip is levitating in the air. There's nothing under it. There's no support whatsoever. We've got two options now. We can cut through the frame and let the front clip drop on the ground and then uh, with all our might try to lift it back up maybe with some some jacks and some more jack stands. Maybe get some help from our friends and have them help us try to lift the frame back up and support it somehow so that it's somewhat straight so that we can weld it back on and, and hope to God the alignment's good when we're done. Or we can use a little bit more brains and not let the frame drop in the first place. So what I just did was welded a leg onto each corner, basically turning this whole front clip into a little four-legged table. So when I make the cuts back in the back, nothing is gonna happen. Not a thing. Not even gonna know it was cut. The cut I'm gonna make in the frame is straight up and down. I just used a square, just right off the ground. Again, doesn't have to be crazy perfect, but you do want it to be straight up and down. I've seen a few people do it angled, and you definitely don't want that because if you angle the cut, you're actually sliding the front clip forward or back, and you definitely don't want that. We want straight up and down. Oh, shit. <laughs> Today on this episode of What Not To Do by Aaron from Man Candy Creations. Don't do that. Basically what you just saw was me almost losing the truck off the jack stands and then being saved by a miracle, basically. <laughs> Let me explain. As I mentioned before, the truck is situated on four jack stands. Two in the back, two in the front. What I didn't mention though, is that the rear of the truck is still almost fully assembled. The axle's still there, the fuel tank's still there, air management is still there. So the back of the truck is still pretty heavy. And what I didn't mention was that the rear jack stands are actually in the rear of the cab, which is more so in the center of the vehicle. So what happened was the weight of the front clip is actually what was holding the whole front end down on the front jack stands. And when I cut all the way through the frame, all that weight was gone and the truck started to tilt back. In theory, the truck should have continued to tip backwards until the frame hit the ground. Uh, 
in which time it probably would have slid off the back jack stands, a lot of noise would have happened, I would have been screaming and swearing because a painted truck was falling, but it didn't. A miracle happened. Back behind the truck I had two of my homemade jack stands, just chilling. I wasn't even using them, I just pushed them out of the way so I wouldn't trip on them. And the tiniest little edge of the rear of the frame caught one of the jack stands that kept the entire truck from falling over. Well, that was just stupidity on my part. That's what happens when you focus on YouTube videos rather than what you're supposed to be focusing on. So, uh, support your frame, guys. All right, back on track. Everything's back where it's supposed to be, and this is what it was supposed to look like when we cut through the frame. Nothing exciting. Nothing was supposed to move. I've got several more things to do to the front before I can weld it back on, but I'm running out of time and I don't think I'm going to get to the entire project in this episode. It's going to have to be a two-part episode, but I wanted to jump ahead really quick so I can deliver the punchline of why I weld the legs on the front in the first place. You're going to need to make yourself some spacers that equal the amount of the Z that you want to do. I'm doing a two-inch Z, so I need two-inch spacers. I'm going to use some two-by-fours to get my point across, but Two by fours are not two inches by four inches, so I will be making some two inch spacers when it's actually time to weld this thing back on. Now the frame is propped up where you want it to be. Now you can make your stencils or patterns uh, and prep to weld it back together. I am going to go in detail on how I do that in the next video. But for now, I'm going to move on to narrowing the front of the frame. I just came up with an experimental method on how to narrow this frame, but since I've never done it before, rather than pretend like I know what I'm doing, I'm just going to film as I go and as I learn, and in the end, I'll tell you if I recommend it or not. This is that experimental method. It's a temporary cross member that I will be welding to the frame because when I cut through the factory cross member, my stable four-legged assembly is going to become very unstable. This will keep everything steady, but will allow me to slide one frame rail over to meet the other one. Hey, that went almost as smoothly as I imagined it would. Uh, it was a lot harder to move, took a lot more strength than I expected, but uh, all in all, I would, I would still recommend this to a friend. All right, both frame rails have been shifted two inches towards the center for a total of four inches. The frame has also been lifted two inches for the Z, and everything is set in place and ready to be welded back together. And we are out of time. If you want to see the rest, hit the subscribe button. I'm coming back with a part two. We're going to talk about making templates, patterns, cutting stuff out with a plasma cutter, and a cutoff wheel if you don't have a plasma cutter. It's going to be a good time. Have a good week, guys. Keep moving forward.